Today's lesson, scripture reading, is taken from Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. On that day when evening had come, Jesus told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? I don't think he said it with that tone of voice, though. They probably said a little more enthusiastically. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the word today. Um, I've entitled the message personal but not private. And hopefully as we go into the word today, it will make sense why um, that title is what it is. So as we go into the word, let's uh, pray. Lord, thank you for your word. You've given your word to us. And please, through your spirit, speak to us as only you can. You know exactly what we need, when we need it, and how to meet that need. And so we pray that you open our hearts and minds, that we may be spiritually nourished. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very uh, distinct shift, if you will, in Jesus' ministry that we just read, coming at the end of chapter 4. As we come into the fourth chapter, a little bit of an overview. In chapter 1, Jesus is baptized, goes into the wilderness for 40 days, comes out and begins preaching. He also gave, gathers some followers. And in that very first chapter, the first thing that he does is he drives out unclean spirits. It's the first thing. Then if you read the rest of that chapter, he heals many people. Then he goes off to be by himself. After that, he comes out and then he heals a man with leprosy. This is the first chapter. The second chapter of Mark, you see him heal a paralytic man. The third chapter, he continues to heal people. He also calls 12 people to his side, disciples, followers, that now he designates as apostles, which means they too are now going to go out. And then in chapter 4, there's a whole bunch of parables about faith of which we've read uh, last week, I believe, the sower and seeds and so forth. So when we come to these last verses of this chapter, we see that all of a sudden Jesus' expanse of his authority and power does not just extend to demonic influences or unclean spirits, nor is it limited to the physical parts of our body, but to the elements of nature itself. He's expanding his demonstration of his authority. And while all this is taking place, it is easy to overlook one thing that is profound in its nature. Uh, if you're familiar with scripture, you probably read this, this verse, these verses a number of times. It's not a new verse. You probably heard it if you've been in church throughout the decades. But one thing that is very profoundly unique that the first disciples would experience is that <laughs> All this is taking place in a manner and in a way that while it is incredibly personal, if you think you're going to die because the boat's going to be capsized, that's very personal. 
but it's not private. Jesus' ministry from the get-go is defined by the depth of its personal touch. No one can touch the deepest parts of what we, who we are, what we think, our very core being like God. It is the most personal relationship there is. But it is not private. And that in lies a challenge. At the very end of this, he says to them, why are you all afraid? It's plural. Why are you all afraid? Do you all still have no faith? Personal, you bet, but not private. And it lends credence to something that is profoundly powerful, but is easily overlooked. And that is this. The kingdom of God and the power of the Holy Spirit moves by way of testimony. That sounds maybe abstract. But when you begin to see what's taking place, what Jesus is doing with his disciples is taking men and women, but in this case men, who have not gone through any authorized, accredited school. You can't get up here unless you spend four years in seminary. It's a different paradigm. He didn't do that. And what he did is brought them through an experience in which their experience gave birth to the movement of God by way of testimony. This is how the Spirit of God moves. Through testimony. Through one person bearing witness to another person, their experience. Through one person maybe telling a group of other people their experience. And even though they may not have understood the experience, the experiences of all of his disciples come together in a book that we call testimony. So we can actually glean spiritual strength, spiritual power, if you will, spiritual comfort, spiritual revelation based on their testimony. That's why it's so powerful. However, testimony will always be thwarted by the enemy. So, when we take a look at what Jesus ran against or his resistance, it was always against people that were very well schooled and knew a lot, but did not have the revelation that the Spirit of God was giving. This is, this is the difference, this is the conflict between revelation, if you will, revelation that can only come by the Spirit, revelation that um, gives us experience as compared to reason. Revelation, reason. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Nicodemus is a very well-educated man. Knows the scriptures very well. And says to Jesus, teacher. Well, rabbi, which means teacher. Rabbi. We, meaning all of us that are well-educated, 
And there's nothing wrong with education, by the way. I'm a big pro, pro education. We who have studied and by way of reason know that you're a teacher who's come from God. Because by reason, no one can do the things you're doing unless God was with him. So please help me gain reasonable understanding as to what you're doing. You remember Jesus' reply? Look it up. No, he didn't say that. Look it up. It'd be kind of funny if he did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In reply, Jesus declared, no one can see, perceive the kingdom unless he's born again. That statement is a statement of revelation, not reason, but divine revelation. <laughs> Nicodemus goes back to reason. Uh, certainly a guy can't, an old man can't go back into his mother's womb to be born. Surely that can't happen. He goes back to his reason. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless you are, no one can enter now, not just perceive it, but live in it unless you are born of water and the spirit. You shouldn't be surprised. You're a spiritual teacher. However, you don't have revelation because spiritual knowledge is always given by revelation. It's not given by reason. You don't think your way into the kingdom of God. It's revelation. So when it's preached, and you maybe hear it for the first time, that preaching may give that revelation in your spirit to the truth of it, but you didn't approach it and get that way through reason. It came by revelation. Now, Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water in the spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. I mean, after all, you're a spiritual teacher. You shouldn't be surprised at this. Everyone, or before we back up, the wind, and he uses that intentionally because the, the, the Greek word for wind is pneuma, and it's the same word for spirit. It's the same word. The wind or spirit blows wherever it pleases. You can't reason with the wind. Have you ever tried? No, oh, man. And we just really want to be in control of the weather. I can't tell you how many times a day I look at my weather app. Oh, I got to figure it out. I got, why do you have to figure it out? Because I feel I'm in control of the wind. No, you're not. You shouldn't be surprised, Jesus says, of my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it's going. You can't figure it out. And therein lies the conflict with an idea or understanding that if we can just get enough knowledge of God, we can figure it out. If we just had the right creeds, the right doctrines, the right practices, we can figure it out. And when it doesn't work, we get frustrated. But this is the model, if you will, of Jesus' ministry. We stand on the shoulders of 2,000 years of history. So we have, you know, just go up and down Coloma, just dun, 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 and this is what we believe, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, and what you can do then is to a certain degree understand the differences of each group's understanding. You can do that, okay? But 
But professing our faith is not the same as bearing witness to it. In other words, professing something doesn't necessarily mean that you believe it. You can profess something and not necessarily believe it. That takes experience. So the disciples already believe in Jesus. That's why they're following him. Meaning, at this point in time, they don't have doctrines. It's not like Jesus said, hi, I'm Jesus. Here's the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> I mean, no, they have... There's no witness in terms of his death and resurrection because that hasn't happened. The only thing that they know is that God is doing something through this guy. God is doing something. And I trust in that. I can perceive that God is involved. I trust in what he's saying about it. I trust in what God is doing through it. And so I'm putting my faith in him. I'm trusting him, and I, to a certain degree, am pledging allegiance to that. But, as we read previously, it comes in with a little tiny seed, but the seed has to grow. As Jesus says, faith is like the word of God. Uh, it's like a little mustard seed when it grows. You know, faith begins to grow, and it just... So, you can only grow by way of revelation, you cannot grow by understanding. Understanding is very helpful, but it is not the foundation of how the spirit moves. So for example, when Pentecost came, this, nobody had any idea what was happening. All they knew is they were gathering for Pentecost. They didn't plan that day, you know, the, all the disciples, because you imagine the disciples waking up, oh, it's Pentecost, we better wear red. <laughs> no, that's way, way before that. It was a Jewish festival for a week. So they were in Jerusalem with this festival of Pentecost. And all of a sudden, unbeknownst to them, I mean, they were expecting something, but maybe not that particular day, the Spirit came down in such a powerful way that the kingdom of God, now think about this, expanded by way of testimony. So all of the Jews that came to Jerusalem from all over the empire, all of a sudden heard this news, experienced something, and went back to their synagogues and bore testimony to it. They didn't go to a Bible study although that's helpful, they used or they, they moved the spirit or the spirit moved through them, I should say, by testimony. They all went back to their synagogues. How was Pentecost this year, my dear? You're not going to believe what happened. God sent Jesus. And now they're sharing their experience. It's called testimony. Testimony supersedes reason. Reason attached to arrogance will try to shut down testimony. You don't have the right to bear witness because you didn't have the you don't have the education that I have. And this is the conflict that we see play out between Jesus and the people that are reliant not on revelation, his revelation, but on reason. He goes to Jerusalem for a feast. We don't know what feast it is, but he goes to Jerusalem. And there's a man that's been paralyzed for 38 years and heals the man. And the religious leadership says to the man, it's the Sabbath, you're not allowed to carry your mat. It's good that you're healed and all, but you can't carry stuff. That's part of the rules. Jesus intention, he could have healed that man the next day or the day before. He chose the Sabbath 
to demonstrate that you're not going to be in control of the Holy Spirit. You must surrender to it. And our reason refuses to surrender to the Spirit of God. And I don't mean this because this is the argument that, that, that reason will use. Oh, you're just going to be, just throw reason to, no, you're not going to throw reason under the bus. We're made to be reason. But reason doesn't drive the bus. The Spirit of God does. So this is incredibly profound because as a ministry or as a group of people that are followers of Christ, we could have all of the right theology. We can have all of the right doctrines that really to the best of our ability articulate spiritual truth. We can have the best understanding of what particular Greek words mean. We can have the best understanding of how this Hebrew text is interpreted. We can have all of that and be spiritually dead if testimony is not practiced. And because it can be so foreign, it can be something that we almost try to avoid because it's not new, or because it's new, rather. I'll give you one example of this biblically. In the moment. Jesus is baptizing more people than John at this point, although it wasn't him that was baptizing, it was his disciples. And when the Pharisees learned of this, Jesus said, uh, or heard of it, Jesus said, no, I'm not going to stick around here. Um, they're going to come down and try to figure out what I'm doing. They're not going to figure out what I'm doing. It's just going to create conflict. So he goes back to Galilee. He's going through Samaria. And he runs into a Samaritan woman. These people are like this, Samaritan and Jews. They're this close to, if you say the wrong thing, I'm picking up a rock and I'm going to take you out. They're that close. And this Samaritan woman comes to the well. Jesus is tired and he asks her for a drink. You might feel, when you're getting, getting water, would you mind get me a drink? Her immediate reply you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? His reply, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's speaking to you, talking to you, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. In other words, if you had revelation about who you're talking to, you would have asked him and he would have given you something far more valuable than what you're here for. Then she goes into reason. You don't have anything to draw with. And, and the well is deep. What are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well. Drank from it itself, as did his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, everybody who drinks, he takes her reason. Everyone who drinks from this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never be thirsty. Then she goes back to reason. Please give me this water because I'm really tired of going in this well and having to drink. It's a long way. I have to carry the water the way we could. Then he says this, you ready for this? Go call your husband and come back. I don't have a husband. We used to call it shacking up. I don't know if that's still in the vernacular. I don't have a husband. She said, Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The truth is you've had five. The reality is the person you're now with is not your husband. Then she goes into reason. I can see you're a prophet. Our people worshiped on this mountain. This is our theology. Here's our doctrine. We worship on, but you Jews say that the place where we have to worship is in Jerusalem. So we don't have anything in common. 
Because this is our doctrine. This is our creed. This is our tradition. This is how we do things. And this is how the Jews do things. And this is why there's going to be separation. She goes right into this, what she knows. Jesus declares now, I tell you the truth, or gune is the Greek word for woman. Woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And later goes on to say, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And if you think you're going to figure that out, you won't, because the mind is incapable of understanding the spirit. But we're so programmed to figure it out. It's just conditioning. From the moment we wake up, we need to plan out what our day is going to be, right? Right? And if it doesn't go our way, we get angry. How dare you, God? I have systematically figured out my whole day. And my reason is what I rely on, is what I count on, is what is my North Star. And you have no right to infringe on my plans. That's the rebellious nature. Anyone ever experienced that this last week? So this is very, very profound, this, this, this conflict here. Because it's something that every single disciple has to deal with. Every single follower has to deal with. I thought God was going to do this. It doesn't seem to be. I don't know. And as soon as I don't know, I get really uncomfortable as soon as I don't know, I feel very insecure. It's human nature. But with the Spirit, it's not what we know, it's who we know. And the Spirit always moves by testimony, sharing. In addition to the Samaritan woman, let me give you an example of this. In, in, in a personal one. <clears throat> number of, uh, maybe years ago now, as you know, I used to attend a uh, place called Starbucks <laughs> regularly. And it was a Bible study from, with a few young men. And I saw them and whatever, grab my coffee, continue on. And then one day they asked to, if I would join them. Uh, so what's the first thing that somebody does or what's the first reaction commonly if someone presents something to you spiritually? Oh, let me figure this out first. And there's nothing wrong with trying to figure it out, but probably praying about it would be better because God will give discernment. But I started to, to, to get involved. I've never seen anything like it. You got four men, three of which grew up in the same Catholic church. I mean, they've known each other for years. When the pandemic hit, one of the young men whose church closed said, uh-uh, I'm going to church, and found another Catholic church and threw himself into his faith and, and started a Bible study. Subsequently, his cousin is now baptized within the Catholic Church because he got into the faith. His friend who grew up with him at this Catholic Church, none of that was working for him. He happened to find another church, and the moment he walked in was slain in the Spirit, baptized right then and there, and has been going to that church ever since then. Another guy... <laughs> Grew up going to church a bit with his grandmother, very little, but it was there a little bit. But then when he was in a youth group, got baptized because everybody else was kind of doing that. And he thought he should probably do that and so on and so forth. But then eh, he just kind of fell away. And then a few years ago, walked back into a church, more of a mega church. And immediately the spirit just convicted him. And he's been following God all since then. Now, none of those guys are ever going to go to each other's churches. 
No way. But we get together by the spirit of the living God every Wednesday to get around his word. And it messed me up because I couldn't figure it out. I'm a professional people. I took out student loans to know everything about God. We have committees. We have other professionals. We have, no, you're never going to figure out God. But the testimony is what brings us all together. The testimony. The testimony, as we were talking with uh, Bob yesterday, the testimony at that men's group is what kept us going talking about God for 45 minutes after the Bible study was done. This testimony. I can know more with another person spiritually if that setup is their testimony as compared, because you can be at church, you know, for two decades, three decades, and never know another person at your church. But see, the spirit will only move, can only move through the testimony of the body of Christ. It's, it's what we call, if you want to use layman's terms, which is another term, I don't like layman. You, you can't find it. I'm better than you because I have this collar on? Who came up with that? Constantine. <laughs> but now let me ask you this. Don't you feel better when I'm wearing it? <laughs> I know I do. It's there. It, I'm wearing the uniform, folks. It's so ingrained. You mean my testimony is more valuable than yours? No. No. Not at all. Your testimony is able to reach people that I could never reach. Because we, as Paul talks about us together as followers, are a body of Christ, not an institution of Christ. A body, and a body is living and breathing and needs one another. Try getting around without your foot. Put a cast on, oh man, I really need my foot. But you don't really know you need your foot till your foot's broken. So this is so powerful. This is why Paul and all of the apostles never created, if you will, a professional class because it would work against what God was doing. In, you know, when the Spirit comes in, the Spirit dwells in every single one of us. That is a radically new, 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 new idea because until Christ, the Spirit was in the temple and you had to go to the temple because that's where the Spirit of God is. And once the Spirit of God, through Christ baptizing us in His Spirit, it means we're the temple. But psychologically, it's a lot more easier to say, I'm going to go to church than to, I am the church. I am the temple. I am. So when the temple comes together, it doesn't matter where it is. Or, but when the testimony flows... The, the, the fellowship takes off. You don't ever want to leave. Tell me about your, 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 your walk with God. Tell me what God sp spoke to you about this week. What did God reveal to you this week? I've had a two-year conversation with one guy that said one thing, one phrase, in talking about the church where he went to, and he said, music's too loud. He was just testifying, just sharing. But it's like a pebble in my foot. I'm like, what does that mean? And we've been having a conversation for two years. What does it mean to gather in worship? What is, what's the purpose of the music? What is all this stuff that's, that's been, what is going on? It's been a wonderful ride. It's been frustrating. Because when I want to find something out, when I want to figure something out, I want to figure it out as soon as I can. Don't you? I don't want to wait on God to give me the answers. I want to know it. I want to know it now. 
but God will only reveal what we need to know when we need to know it on his time frame. Jesus says this, and I'm going to close with this. Or John says this, is John testifying about Jesus. He says, he testifies, this is Jesus now. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. But no one accepts his testimony because they can't figure it out. And see, if you think about it, that's a whole, that would, if you really begin to pray on this, it's a whole new terrain. Because for many hundreds of years now, just the way that we approach things is not necessarily conducive to that. Are you going to share your testimony today? It's not really conducive. It'd be like, I use this example, inviting my family over for Thanksgiving. We put all the, the chairs facing one direction and we watch a football game and then go home. I mean, it's not really Thanksgiving. We have to talk. We have to make a meal together. We have to share. We have to, how was your day? That kind of thing. So my friends in Christ, what we read today is far more than a story or an account but a revelation of what God is doing that's radically different. Up until Jesus, only the priests were allowed to do sacrifices and serve at the temple. There was a whole caste system. Only the Pharisees could teach. But with the, with the giving of the Holy Spirit, everybody has a gift. How am I going to know your gift if you don't share it with me? I'm not. I'm not going to be edified. I can't be. I need your testimony. And you need mine. And quite frankly, my testimony would be much more powerful than anything I teach. Teaching's good. I like listening to teachers, but I want to know where they're coming from. And their testimony is much more powerful. This is all of the letters of Paul, their testimony of the revelation that God has given him. So my friends in Christ, as we go through our lives, as we continue on in this journey, let's reconsider the power that God has put within us, the spirit, his spirit within us, and how best we can live that out. My friend F has brought five people to the Lord. When he first told me, when he first did this, he goes, hey, I got a praise report. What? Yeah, two people. One, one guy I was working at, um, working on and, and in, in his work. Uh, he's a Mormon, and I brought him to church, and now he's baptized. And, da, da, da. and the other person was a Sikh, and, he, and I brought him to church, and he got baptized. Da, da, da. And you know what my first instinct to say was? How dare you do that? You don't have a degree. <laughs> you don't have that kind of authority. And God's like, Wow. Really? God is moving in ways that I do not know. But that's okay. I don't need to know. I just need to listen to his spirit and seek his kingdom. And he will reveal because he's faithful that way. Let's pray as we uh, continue on with the sermon hymn. Lord, please forgive us for entertaining the idea that we can have it all figured out. Or believing that we really don't have a need to figure it out and we're living by faith because to be honest with you, we're all living to the level of faith that you've given us and we can all have more. So as you continue to guide us and direct us and open our eyes, may we be able to see through revelation who you truly are your presence with us, this kingdom that you've brought us into, and the truth of your word. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>